I'm just gonna throw on a sweatshirt. Report, buddy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, easy. Awesome. Okay, cool. Sweet, man. Nice. Yeah, really glad to to connect. Um, it's been uh, it's been a crazy ride, I guess, for you guys now. But uh, I see things are developing. Like the website is uh, is showing more and more of what you guys are building. So, congrats. Yeah, it's been yeah, it's been a fun time. There's been a definitely a lot of uh turmoil in the broader market but we've been just trying to keep heads down building and the product's definitely coming along a lot which has been great nice one do you have any questions for me before we get started generally um or about this podcast or uh yeah i guess like the i guess the quick pitch on just what the the podcast audience is and i guess sure. like even just na nature of the questions that you'll be asking we're about to just get a quick demo of course there. sure so i mean our background and i'm not sure how much i kind of dove into it um the first time that we spoke but you know we we created this festival called tech open air in berlin um which is an interdisciplinary festival and um, you know, it has technology sort of as the common denominator to connect people from the worlds of obviously tech. Um, so, you know, all the insiders, the startups, the venture capitalists and so forth. But then beyond mm -hmm. that, from academia um, and from, uh, you know, the science communities in general, but also the arts and the creatives and, you know, the music, the art, um, media. Uh, and kind of the last two to show up were the policy makers. And, you know, so now we've mm -hmm. got the politicians also gracing our stages um, and we've been doing it for a lot of years. We, we you know, really started as a community product um, or project. Mm -hmm. You know, we were the first crowdfunded festival in Europe, actually, or even event in general uh, in mm -hmm. 2012. And, you know, we got just some cash together and we rented this old Berlin techno club. And we thought it would be cool to get a, a technology conference like into the music and art environment of Berlin. And we had 600 attendees and you know, it just grew organically. Like we were all volunteers. We didn't have a company. Nobody was getting paid until 2016. And, you know, I was working at Amazon. And by that time it had, you know, just grown into already, you know, a few thousand people. And, and I was like, okay, this is getting too big to just do as a part-time job, uh, you know, or not even part-time job, you know, I guess, you know, <laughs> after hours uh, gig. Mm -hmm. um, and so I raised some money uh, for tour. Uh, we actually got all the unicorn founders uh, at that time uh, in Germany and a few others from other European countries together. So kind of all the Web2 uh, folks, you know, from N26 to, um, you know, SoundCloud to uh, Zalando and HelloFresh and Delivery Hero and, you know, all these kind of Euro European Web2 company founders. And they just, you know, chipped in and said, okay, let's, you know, build the best tech event in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, fast forward 2019, our biggest edition, 22,000 attendees um, and, you know, spanning multiple days and multiple locations all across Berlin. And then we went into Japan and Mexico and US and expanded geographically and then COVID hit. And then we like, yep. shit, um, okay, uh, that business will not uh, flourish for a while. Um, and so we pivoted into online education and, uh, since web three and crypto was always part of what we did, I mean, we had, you know, the first crypto talks in 2012, um, you know, at the first conference, we had the first dedicated stage in 2013, we had Gavin Wood present Ethereum before it was actually, uh, you know, public or before there was a token, um, and there were some people in the audience who got very, very rich of attending the talk. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't me it wasn't me because i wasn't in the audience i was backstage uh putting up fires uh, i didn't even see yeah. the talk didn't even see the talk um but yeah so so uh we built this online product called club and it's a cohort based learning um community and we focus here just um you know on web3 skills so it's web3 skill development in a cohort based learning way um and that's what we've been building over the last year 
so our first true digital product. Um, and alongside that, you know, we also went into online media, of course, you know, to bridge that mm -hmm. time of, you know, not having any physical events. So the podcast was born. Um, I mean, we had a podcast before, also crypto podcast in 2017 about like uh, tokenizing assets uh, back then. Yeah. But, you know, now we have that, you know, podcast, which is a little bit like our stage one, you know, at tour, which is always kind of very interdisciplinary for anybody from, uh, you know, tech founders to VC. We had Albert Wenger on, we had uh, Lasse from 1KX on, um, but also philosophers, authors, uh, you know, musicians, Imogen Heap, you know, all, all kinds of people, but always people that do something in their discipline with technology, right? That's always kind of the common denominator. In terms of audience, it's, uh, it's similar to our general audience. So we, we typically are like one third uh, startup uh, folks. So, um, you know, founders, but also startup employees. Um, one third is more like corporate enterprise, you know, that look for guidance in what's kind of coming next um, at Tor. And then the last third is um, anything from like the investor community to the creative community, you know, lots of agency folks also. Um, you know, from uh, kind of classic advertising agencies, social media agencies, so forth, um, but also NGOs, you know, very diverse. Um, so yeah, we can, uh, we can talk about all things, uh, you know, Web3, you know, gating communities, uh, NFTs versus social tokens, um, you know, what you're building concretely, of course, um, kind of your view on, you know, what this kind of will look like in a year or two, uh, how do we get mass adoption in the space? Um, you know, things like this. But if you have anything that you would like to hone down on, you know, or steer away from, uh, you know, let me know. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing there really. And so in, yeah. then just to clarify, so should I have QuickTime Player up and be recording it myself or are we going to use the Zoom recording? That that would be, uh, I think it's better safe than sorry. That would be great. I mean, now Zoom also offers this local recording. So I never know if it's still really needed, but I also just, okay. my producer always says, do it. So um, yeah, if, if you could, okay. that would be great. Yeah, no worries. Is it going to pick up your audio too though? No, 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 no. I'm doing I my see. own quick time. Oh, okay. Got it. I see. Perfect. So you, we do two quick times because they then basically, whatever happens with our Zoom connection, we just keep it running. So even if like I'm frozen, you know, I keep on talking and then it's all there always anyway. And, and then, you know, we just send both files to the editor and they edit it all together. Okay, perfect. Cool. Well, I've got, uh, I've got recording going. Um, yeah, I'm Same. ready to go. All right, cool. Let's do it, Matt. Um, okay. Welcome to another episode of the Tour On Air podcast. And I'm joined today by Matt Alston, who's the founder of Bonfire. Um, how would you describe Bonfire in a sentence, Matt? Yeah, Bonfire is building a no-code platform for Web3 communities um, to build and engage uh, with, their, with their fans. That's it. And I'm really intrigued to be talking to you. Um, full disclosure, maybe ahead, I'm a you know, small investor. Uh, in Bonfire and uh, maybe just anecdotally, like the way that this was presented to us uh, in the squad kind of team um, was, you know, this guy was like this crazy product manager before and he just kicks ass and knows how to build product. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about that experience, you know, that led you to now building Bonfire? Sure. Yeah. So I studied computer science in school. I attended Duke, which is where I met my co-founder, Melissa. Um, and then graduating Duke, I actually pivoted into product management, um, joined Uber in 2017. Um, it was like right kind of as they were at their low point and starting to uh, hit an inflection point. It was sort of between Travis and Dara and got to see really the company over the next three years. Um, you know, rebuild its brand from uh, kind of nothing and uh, really turn over a lot of leadership, but like reinstill cultural values, like the entire company's culture and kind of um, just like way of working shifted. And so I was kind of there and got to see a front, uh, got to have a front row seat as like one of the more fascinating companies, I think of the last decade, like went through maybe its most fascinating period. 
Um, and so I learned a ton there and I spent the bulk of my time actually working on rider loyalty and rewards. Um, Uber had really like a, a problem already, which was just, uh, you know, consumers, riders viewed it as a commodity product. They were sort of indifferent to Uber versus its competitors um, and only really cared about the price. And so uh, part of the loyalty program was like, how do we engender uh, long-term loyalty, build a relationship that is a little less transactional um, with our customers. And then of course, the need for that was only compounded by everything that happened in 2017 um, in terms of the kind of brand and reputation damage that uh, you know, Uber, Uber had to go through. And so the loyalty program was really a big bet. And like, how do we like, um, really like shift the value of um, the relationship with our with our riders. And so that was the experience I had at Uber, which definitely informs a lot of the way that I also think about uh, building in Web3 for creators, community builders, and brands. I mean, maybe just one follow-up on this. Like I'm really intrigued, you know, to, to hear like how, because in my perception, you know, not, not knowing any of the data, um, but you know, like you were saying, also like it—it it seems like a kind of utility type of functional product. You know, maybe a commodity product, low barriers to entry. You know, um, what did you like? How important was actually that brand um, in that period of time and that brand damage also? Like, was that really visible in the data? Like, was this really hurting the business, or was it maybe an exercise also for just retention and you know? Uh, growing, you know, kind of the, the the workforce and, you know, getting good talent to join the company that kind of drove the the work that uh, that you all did uh, on on the brand and ultimately also, I guess, Travis leaving. Yeah, um, so the brand damage was uh, extremely material and definitely showed up in the data. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was it was very easy to just see kind of at least, you know, order of magnitude wise, maybe not precisely, but like how much um, of a negative impact it had on the business. Um, and then also kind of leading up into that period, um, it wasn't the case that, you know, Uber had fully solved for unit economics and like knew exactly, you know, how much they made on trips. And they were, there was a company that was heavily reliant on subsidies and incentives. Um, and so Partially, you could see that the brand damage was definitely impacting the business, but also partially um, as the company matured, it needed to reduce its reliance on uh, that type of like per trip subsidy anyways, um, and get to a model that was a lot more sustainable. The uh, kind of mental model for the company, I think up until that point was, you know, grow at all costs and um, try to achieve, you know, sort of that um, category leader position and, and then make money. Um, and I think that, uh, it was around 2017 that they realized, like, you know, we need to actually start proving out the unit economics. Uh, we need to stop, you know, spending a billion dollars a quarter on incentives and, and really like yeah. see kind of what a sustainable model looks like for Uber. And so loyalty was also part of that story. It's like, if, if we can build a long-term relationship and if we can connect the business verticals. So we have Eats, that's an advantage that some of our competitors didn't have. Like, how do we pull those two verticals together and offer a program that's like greater than the sum of its parts. Um, that was like very much part of the narrative of like um, one Uber, like kind of how do we create this program which um, shifts people from price shopping on a per trip basis and actually uh, helps build brand loyalty for, for Uber. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think often people underestimate the amount that we see subsidize our lives. Um, as you know, early adopters of, of these products. But eventually you realize like once you start seeing now, you know, from time to time that a, a traditional yellow cab is cheaper than an Uber ride, you're like, okay, now uh, they got their unit economics, I guess, uh, you know, to, to be a little bit more attractive. Um, yeah, and what there is a, yeah, sorry. Oh, no? Sorry to interrupt. There was a summer where I uh, ate for free. It was, it was while I was in college and I was interning in the Bay Area and there were so many food delivery services out all with like those, you know, onboard yeah. somebody new, like both people get 25 bucks. And I just, you know, created a few accounts on all the different platforms, sending myself invites. And I basically ate for <laughs> free for a whole summer. And that just kind of accentuated exactly how much VCs were subsidizing the whole affair. Yeah, good for you. Um, I mean, all relevant also for our conversation now leading into into Web3. I mean, you know, how would you say, I mean, you know, having worked on a product that has, you know, really 
um, managed to get that insane mass adoption, right? Like Uber. Um, I mean, I'm sure you think so much about like what were those, you know, three, four key ingredients, learnings that you want to now um, infuse into your Web3 business where despite, you know, all the, you know, fun, engaging, wild, uh, you know, intriguing um, and experimental stuff that is happening, you know, we just haven't really seen this mass adoption yet. Yeah, I think Web3 is definitely in the, um, you know, there's not really best practices or playbooks uh, for anything, um, you know, business model, growth, flywheels, like product market fit, I would say, you know, there are a lot of projects which are able to capture it over a short period of time. Um, and it's driven largely by hype, but uh, we still haven't seen longevity in a lot of projects or companies. We still haven't seen like sustained product market fit that doesn't rely on any kind of um, like ex extrinsic incentive. Um, or you haven't seen a ton of examples yet. And so I think Web3 kind of creates this new landscape, um, which creates a much broader design space on everything from product to how you build community to like your business model to your value sharing model with your community. Um, and I think we're still really, really early in exploring that. And so we're very much at the like, you know, a thousand experiments um, a day kind of phase. Um, but I do think like having worked at Uber um, and having an appreciation for just what like a, you know, global consumer scale business looks like and, you know, the precision with which it needs to be run um, and like the extent to which um, like Uber found product market fit early and that kind of carried it through, you know, all ups and downs kind of through the trajectory of the company. I think that's the type of product market fit that um, we're seeking to find with Bonfire. And I think that's really the, the stage that we're at in Web3 is like companies are still seeking that. Um, it wasn't until recently that the infrastructure could even support you know, thousands, tens of thousands of users, we're still definitely not at a world where it can support millions, tens of millions, like that number. And so I think the infrastructure is getting there. The applications are very like early in development. I think this bear market is going to be a great opportunity for the product builders to like go heads down and really like build those products such that, you know, maybe the next bull run, um, we do see something that really reaches scale that would be meaningful on a web two um sort of you know uh in a web two environment because when we look at sort of you know incentivization uh you know in connection to product market fit right and and we look at sort of the co-ownership model in web three and you know the way that you know the the company or the project is tokenized and you know um the potential upside is shared with you know early users for example um you know how 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 would you say like how good is that model already uh, and and how much risk is there in that model um maybe not or giving us sort of false sense of product market fit um where you know people may you know spread the love on a project or the you know start using a project uh, because they want those tokens airdrop versus you know actual um value proposition of the underlying product yeah, I think it's really tricky because having a token incentive early in the life of the product is going to um, make it extremely hard to, to get visibility on whether or not you've actually solved the problem for people. Um, mm -hmm. It's very hard to know if you have product market fit when you're incentivizing the behavior. And the whole kind of idea um, around these these token incentives is that you can use them to bootstrap a network. And so, you know, you use the tokens as a monetary incentive uh, when there's not a lot of utility yet, but you believe that at scale, um, network effects start to kick in, utility starts to become like the main driver of usage, and then you can reduce your reliance on those incentives, which is the phrase I also mentioned, you know, with respect to Uber. But um, I think that's something that actually, you know, Uber, didn't successfully nail that landing of like, okay, now we have a bunch of users so we can reduce our reliance on incentives. I think actually that same problem sort of exists, exists for a lot of Web3 projects where they realize that they're not actually seeing utility, which can account for, um, you know, the extrinsic incentive later in the life of the company. So they're not able to pull back their extrinsic incentives 
and keep the users. Um, so when they pull back the incentives and the users go flood for the next project, that is still early enough that there's a big um, potential payoff in terms of tokens. And so I think that like theoretically it works, but we're still kind of, um, I guess, waiting for the, the case studies or maybe for some of the companies that have just gotten started recently to uh, hit maturity to really see if the model, um, I guess, works at scale in a way that's like sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so for you then, like, if you think of product market fit, you know, as you're building now, um, I guess you're in that phase, right? Looking for product market fit with Bonfire? Yeah, I would say we're in very much zero to one iterating towards yep. product market fit. Can you tell us a little bit more about that process uh, since, you know, you, you, you have that, you know, web to, you know, kind of background, I, I find it really interesting because it seems like, you know, we were looking at this uh, at Tor and our community, you know, which is obviously made up of a lot of people that are not in the Web3 crypto space. Um, and we were looking for kind of common denominators. And, you know, at one point we were asking ourselves this question, like, uh, you know, a Web3 founder, would there be value for a Web3 founder and a Web2 founder to be in a Discord, for example, in a community? Uh, and, you know, I, I wonder like if things like product market fit, you know, I mean, is it really that different or, you know, is a founder in Web2 and Web3 like, you know, on that same path and journey? How do, how do you think of that now being in Web3 uh, very concretely? Like what are some of the things that at the moment you, you're iterating and testing and, and looking for in terms of results? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it depends on where you're building in Web3. So if you are a protocol developer and like, I would say the lower in the stack you get, the more things look different. Um, and so your customer is really developers and you know, they could be, it's, it's more of like an open source uh, sort of go to market um, and very much a community centric go to market because you don't really have a product that end users can use. Um, your product is smart contracts and you know, that requires engineers to interact with. Mm -hmm. So I think at that level, things may look a bit different and maybe like the open source environment is really like the model to, to look, mm -hmm. um, to learn from history. And I think at the application layer, things really aren't that different because ultimately consumers aren't that different. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the a lot of the like uh, needs that you're solving for consumers really aren't that different. It's just that you've got a different set of um, uh, solutions that you can mm -hmm. like use. I think that sharing ownership with the community is an extremely powerful incentive that we haven't mm -hmm. quite figured out the right way to harness. Um, but I think that's a huge unlock, which should give Web3 companies advantages um, if they're able to like maximize that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, what I will say, I think the one thing that's very different from building in Web2 is just the infrastructure is itself, um, you know, at, a, at a nascent stage. And so um, for us to deliver a really seamless end user experience, it, you know, we depend on blockchains, which don't yet have like the scalability that allows for that or the speed. Um, we rely on wallets where I think a lot of the wallet providers are, are, I mean, some of them are getting pretty good, but it's still not nearly as seamless an experience as onboarding to a lot of Web2 projects. Um, we're dependent on like, you know, API infrastructure, but there's not yet like the AWS. Um, maybe that's something like Alchemy, but um, you know, AWS is a lot more just robust, developed, um, and there's a million, uh, you know, other projects and developers to learn from if you want to like plug into the AWS ecosystem in that quite isn't quite as robust in Web3. So I do think as an application developer, you kind of have to um, build within the rules of the, of the game where in our case, we don't want to go build our own wallet and we don't want to go, you know, solve for everything. We want to focus on creator fan engagement around these Web3 assets, but we do have dependencies on all these pieces of infrastructure, which just aren't quite there yet. And sure. I think that does force you to make a lot more trade-offs. It, um, it narrows kind of what you're able to solve for um, yep. in like the immediate term. So I think it, it just forces you to focus um, on a different set of like, all right, well, what can we uniquely solve and what can we solve so well that people are willing to tolerate some of the user experience setbacks that they're going to incur if they use our product. And when you're solving for that problem of creators and, and sort of fan engagement, um, I, how do you go about it? I mean, you I assume you interview, um, you know, creators, but then 
you know, isn't it like in a space, you know, where really new technology and new markets are formed um, that often the creator may not even really know, you know, um, what that could look like um, because, you know, those technical uh, kind of capabilities are, um, you know, maybe something that the creator so far hasn't, you know, really understood fully or spent much time um, with. Like, how do, how do you go about this? Or do you, you know, talk to more like the developers that are building, you know, that next protocol layer um, to then come up with new ideas that you're pitching to creators to get feedback on? Yeah, so we, um, so we're still in a private beta stage where we onboard every creator manually. So we have a relationship with, we have 160 or so creators onboarded and, and have a relationship with all of them. And so that's been super insightful just to understand like, you know, how do they view the space? Like, what are the use cases that get them really excited? Mm -hmm. um, we also work with creators who have already made the jump. So we're not doing new token minting um, really at all in the platform today. We're focused exclusively on like creators who already have their own social token or NFT oh, collection. Mm -hmm. So they've already like made the jump into Web3, but oftentimes their community hasn't, or maybe like a portion of their community has, but like the overwhelming majority still like doesn't know what Web3 is. And so all the time we're like kind of trying to understand, all right, well, what got you to make the jump? Like what was the promise of Web3 that got you excited? Um, where is the tooling not there yet to kind of enable that promise? Um, and where can we kind of close the gap? And so that's like one big source of how we kind of like try to form our thesis on what the space needs at the application layer. Um, and then also, I think we do, you know, have our own thesis on where the space is going and like what is going to ultimately drive like long term and sustained value for creator for creators and creative communities. Um, and so that's obviously kind of the backbone of our product roadmap as well. And so we do take a very um, like emergent strategy approach to product where, you know, we know that there's a lot that the space hasn't quite solved for and so need to be nimble and need to be able to um, adjust quickly, but also like, you know, need to have a strong, need to have strong conviction in a thesis in order to like, you know, keep up m motivation and excitement and enthusiasm, especially in a, in a period of time like we're about to enter. So at this stage, then you would say you solve for a creator has a token, but maybe, you know, um, the engagement with token holders, you know, is not where it's, at, you know, he, he or she wants it to be, um, or, you know, also the sale of that token uh, maybe needs a little boost. And this is where Bonfire comes into play, a platform that allows for that type of, you know, marketing almost of, you know, the token, but also you know, having engagement tools for, for the community and token holders. Yeah, I probably should have shared more about what actually it is that we're building. So, um, no, yeah, it's good. We, we are leading on... up to it. <laughs> no drum roll. For sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we focus on, uh, we call it like utility as a service sometimes, but we focus on like the utility and um, like engagement around tokens. And so for a social token creator, we build tools like um, for airdrops and bounties and ways to incentivize and reward um, community engagement with your token. Um, and then also ways to reward token holders. So, you know, token gated access to Discord, free or early access to merch or tickets or exclusive access to content. So all of the things which like a fan of a creator is going to covet, um, like those are like scarce resources, typically the creator's time or attention or, you know, number of tickets to a concert and creators should be able to allocate those things to their fans. And like, I think the tokens represent a way of like measuring fandom of incentivizing and rewarding and like bringing your community like kind of into the experience um, a little bit more than we've ever had the uh, possibility of doing. And then on the NFT side, I think what you lose is without fungibility, it's hard to do things like, you know, rewarding um, and like kind of rewarding engagement because you don't have something that yeah, uh, micro stacks. engagement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but there's still a ton of, um, you know, utility that can be imbued within these tokens when it comes to like, it's actually giving you exclusive access to perks or benefits or even just a community of people who also share an affinity for 
a creator or, you know, the interest that the creator represents. Mm -hmm. And so we really think of it as like a way to give, you know, the Facebook group, the Discord server, the, the Reddit sub, the subreddit, like superpowers. Um, and that gets us really, really excited. And what, what do you see, like, um, in terms of interest at the moment? Is it more on the token or on the NFT side? It, it seems to be that, like, I mean, just from my perception, again, not very data, uh driven um but kind of like just you know scanning the space that social tokens um kind of lost out a bit on on nfts for gating community engagement content etc yeah yeah we this was the definitely the thing that we were most wrong about from like yeah. our initial thesis a year ago um which is we just saw um a ton of potential and social tokens still do mm -hmm. But what we've seen over the past year is that NFTs actually can approximate a lot of those things that social tokens can also offer. And they're much simpler. Um, they're much kind of easier to understand. There's a, a lot less complexity you need to solve for. So an NFT, it's visual, it feels good to own. You can look at it and like, you know, you can just value the art on its own. And, and I'm specifically talking about kind of the community subcategory yep. of nfts there's obviously lots of types of nfts but the ones that are like pfps or nft memberships um you know they give you access to a community they're an easy way to gate perks and benefits like they yeah. do a lot of the things a social token can do but you don't you know need to figure out liquidity you don't need to uh yep. reckon with any of the potential like regulations that are, are likely to hit fungible tokens before nfts yep. um and so there's just a lot it's a much more um, approachable place to start, I think, for most for yeah. most creators. And so um, now we kind of have this view that when we say social tokens, we kind of include NFTs in that. Like they mm -hmm. really are both social tokens. Yeah. Um, and we think NFTs are probably like the on-ramp for most communities. It probably makes mm -hmm. sense to start there. And mm -hmm. then I think where social tokens can become really valuable is like, you know, as a, a community reaches maturity, um, Mm -hmm. A, you start to have a lot of different NFTs that might be circulating within that ecosystem. And it's very hard for anyone to know like, all right, well, what does like my NFT represent? Or as a creator, if you wanted to like, say you're a musician and you're announcing your next tour, but you've got mm -hmm. seven different NFT collections out there, like does each one get the same benefits or different benefits? You have yep. to like create seven different token gated links. It becomes very difficult to manage where yep. if you create a social token as like an index of like, you know, this is the, the, you know, um, um, the tr like transactional currency of the community. Like this is what you like earn over time mm -hmm. and all the benefits accrue back to this, like one asset, it's a lot simpler and easier to manage. Um, and so we've seen some projects like, you know, the board apes, like they kind of sure. reached a level of maturity where now they essentially want to create this whole like universe around yep. this or ecosystem around the original project. That's where I think it starts to make a ton of sense to have a social token. Um, yeah. And it's not really like replacing the NFTs. It really is like an additive layer that does things that the NFTs don't do a good job of. Yeah. Yeah. Also, you know, by that time, then you have the funds to, you know, not worry too much about liquidity anymore and, and set it all, yeah. all up. Yeah. And yeah, a professional totally. team who yeah. can like manage, you know, you can hire a consultant to figure out your uh, tokenomics, like a lot yeah. of things that, um, you know, as an individual creator getting started, you just don't have yeah. those resources, probably aren't interested in, in solving those problems. That makes a ton of sense. Um, I mean, while we are building uh, this out also, you know, or thinking about it, you know, for us as a, as a company, um, I mean, one of the questions, you know, we were asking ourselves, um, I wonder if other people have similar questions is like when when you do this with an nft then you know um you know to kind of uh, increase engagement with one's community um you know a membership nft that looks like a card that you know we've seen it with pool suite for example or proof collective um versus you know a pfp type of uh you know nft like do you already see sort of, you know, what works better for what, or, you know, my gut feeling is that, you know, I mean, if you have something like a membership card, then, you know, the, the actual benefit needs to be really solid. Um, but if, you know, you really want to put the benefits, um, you know, at the forefront, then maybe it's good to have the NFT almost, you know, in terms of art design, take a step back and really just be this functional pass to those benefits. 
Whereas, you know, maybe, you know, a PFP, you have the advantage of being able to create almost like a metaversal world and, you know, have maybe deeper emotional ties also uh, to the NFT holder. How do you think about that? Yeah. I definitely think that for whatever reason, PFPs um, resonate more strongly with people. Like mm -hmm. they can be almost like a product in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and the rarities, the traits, all of that element mm -hmm. um, is, is hard to replicate in like a card based NFT. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about the, I guess the other last thing that PFPs do really well is, is they um, allow you to, to signal status. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, PFP, you know, profile picture, people love to make the profile picture a PFP and it allows them to publicly signal their, you know, a, mm -hmm. alignment with a specific community. Um, cards, you know, you rarely see like a card NFT as somebody's PFP. So I think there are some advantages to PFP in that mm -hmm. respect. But I think if you're like, say you're an offline restaurant business and you want to create a membership club, like, does it make sense to try and like create a PFP project around your restaurant? Like yeah. probably not because you really are leading with functional utility and benefits more yeah. so than you're leading with like kind of a Veblen good, like, um, you know, elite mm -hmm. community that people can join. And so I think in that case, what you are using the NFT for is a way to track who owns it, a way to yep. give people like easy entry and exit, a way to like capture secondary royalties on the sales yep. that might happen over time. And so none of that requires like, you know, sophisticated traits and layers. And, and that actually probably complicates the story and the narrative that you're trying to tell. Yeah. Um, because you, you don't really want certain people to like have, you know, a, a more valuable version of the past than others for like, yeah. nothing but chance. Maybe yeah. you actually want to create tiers of cards and then let people like have more valuable versions because of the amount of effort that they put in or because of the amount of money they've spent or you know their lifetime value yeah. to you as a business owner so pool suite i think is interesting because they have cards but also tiers of cards i think yeah. that model probably makes more sense for most like businesses that lead with utility um yeah. if you're just a community for community's sake like board apes then i think he has a lot of like you know advantages there for sure I mean, it, it seems also sometimes, I mean, if I put my cynical German glasses on, you know, I, I also <laughs> sometimes, you know, just wonder, you know, how authentic it is for all these, you know, projects to want to become a, you know, community. And maybe it is, but like, you know, then it is even about like, you know, how likely are you going to have a, you know, engaged online virtual metaversal discord community, for example, um, you know, how sustainable is that? Like if I go into the discords of a lot of, you know, the NFTs maybe that I bought, you know, um, I, mean, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe I'm too old, um, but I, I don't get much value out of it. And I don't see much value in those chats. Like, I, you know, I see a lot of flipping and I see a lot of pumping and I see a lot of kind of status and signaling and okay, maybe that is value um, also, right? You could say, you know, that is maybe a world where then uh, the holders can get that type of, um, you know, almost like confirmation buyers, you know, being kind of given to you, yeah. you know, on a silver platter. Um, you know, I don't want to sound too cynical, um, you know, in the end also, I think it's just so interesting as an experiment and to see where this is going. And I wonder if I have missed something, you know, um, or, you know, to have it maybe, you know, more as a beneficial question to the listener, what can you do to really make that work? Uh, and is it sometimes maybe also okay to say, look, we are an NFT community in the sense that, yeah, we have people showing their NFT, being proud maybe on the design and, you know, putting it on their social media, but actually we're staying away from a discord because it may just be, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And we just don't know how to curate that you know, virtual community in a way that there is sustainable value for its members. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess first off, I definitely share a bit of your cynicism um, when it comes to some of the models that we have seen be popular to date. Um, and I think from a bon from uh, a company perspective, so Bonfire is, is pretty narrowly focused on um, the Web3 assets that are based around utility. Um, yeah. And a, a big reason for that is because it's much easier for us to reason about where it goes and yep. um and 
it's a lot easier for us to get to conviction on the sustainability of the model. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I think that ultimately most brands today pay the bulk of their margin to Facebook and Google for ads. And mm -hmm. that's basically money they're spending to like access new users, yes, but also like mm -hmm. re-access or re-engage their existing fan base because they mm -hmm. don't have direct channels uh, to communicate with them or offer value. Mm -hmm. And so I think that makes a ton of sense to us as a massive, mm -hmm. massive uh, source of value, which right now is being routed through two gatekeepers and which could go to the, the fans or the people supporting the business instead. Mm -hmm. For the creator use case, I think that vertical, same thing. It's like they depend so heavily on these algorithms for, for top of funnel growth and n nobody can build an audience like TikTok and Facebook and, you know, mm -hmm. YouTube. But when it comes to actually owning your audience, like converting casual fans into super fans, and then like really building a brand and business, at some point, you don't want the entirety of that brand and business to be dependent on like a single platform that, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have no control over. And so same thing, it makes a ton of sense to us that these creators do have something that their fans value extremely highly. Um, we know that the willingness to pay of a super fan is so much higher than the creator is currently able to capture on the existing platforms. So it's very easy for us to reason about like the value that's going to be created as some of these things move into Web3. I think when it comes to like the Veblen Good status games that like happen, um, I mean, how many of those projects like held value kind of mm. through the last three weeks and i think the the projects that you see hold value the best are like the blue chips and you know there yeah. there are a set that i think will always hold value and like they'll be resilient to you know a market down market because they were the first or because society chose them as like the winners for whatever reason but i think the other type of community and asset that will hold value are the ones that are priced based on utility because yep. if the market goes down, but I'm holding this pass because I get, you know, access to my favorite local business or creator yep. or like, and there's tangible value there, then, you know, that value is really uncorrelated with markets. Um, yep. And so if there's $100 of value and it's tangible value, um, then the price shouldn't drop below $100. If it does, someone who cares about the, the utility will buy it at that price. Yeah. And so yeah. there's at least the backbone to the value, which is like tangible and, and real, where I think like when you have just the PFP project, um, you know, the value of that thing could be zero to many, many, many millions of dollars. And, and it's sort of impossible to understand like why it might fall on any one place along that uh, yep. uh along that like spectrum so i think that's where we like don't know how that part of the market develops and evolves mm -hmm. over time but we feel really strongly about the utility-based um segment and that that has like durability kind of baked in so it's almost like you're going from a subscriber you know type of business uh you know which i guess you know was the evolution we've seen from kind of ad-based businesses somewhat at least you know over the last few years in web 2 to something of a, like a co-owner, you know, or member, um, you know, type of use case with NFTs. Yeah. 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 And I think there's like the, the sort of table stakes is that you can reduce like fees that are paid to intermediaries and gatekeepers and yeah. like more of the value can go directly to the creator. And then I think the upside is that by being able to access your super fans, there's probably a mm -hmm. lot more value there than you previously realized because, mm -hmm. you know, in an ad based model, everything is aggregated, you know, it's tiny, tiny pennies on like impressions and clicks and that's all invisible to you. But just knowing who your hundred, like most diehard fans are as, as a creator, or as a brand gives you so much more ability to, to monetize and also to give back to those people, um, to reward yep. them for their loyalty, their support, their fandom. So it really is a two way street where I think it's win, win from a, from a creator and a, and a fan or, you know, a community builder, community member point of view. And, you know, the losers here, obviously, um, well, I guess to the extent that there are losers, it would be like the intermediaries and gatekeepers. But, uh, you know, it seems obvious that things are going to move this way because mm -hmm. power has been pretty consistently shifting towards the individual for, for many years now. And I think that kind of has culminated in this new Web3 ownership um, economy that's that's developing. And is the creator for you sort of the San Francisco of Uber kind of like the, the first market you're going after and then eventually it will be brands, um, you know, to, and, and help brands boost that engagement? Yeah, exactly. 
And, yeah. and I think that like as creators, like it, as they mature, as their community grows, as like, you know, they start bringing on people to help manage or like a team yeah. around them, all of a sudden they, they start to look a lot like brands. Um, and yeah. so I think that really that's more of a, um, it's almost like a graduation from like individual creator to like more of a small business or brand. And so we, we very much think about like that whole spectrum as being the addressable market, but very much focused on creators today. And do you want to share like a, a good use case, like one of the best practices you've seen creators already kind of using Bonfire for? Yeah, I think so right now we're, we're pretty focused on the music vertical. And I think that mm -hmm. one's really interesting to us because musicians have one of the most like strong uh, parasocial relationships with their fan bases, like, you know, the emotional impact or like kind of the intangible value of uh, music to people is, mm -hmm. is so hard to quantify, but so immense. And then also musicians make, you know, estimated 10 to 12 percent of like the value that they create in terms of their take home. And so it's like a clear, um, it feels like to us like a clear inefficiency where like they're creating all of this value. It's very hard to capture it because there are so many, uh, you know, intermediaries in that value chain. So we think musicians are super um, interesting as a case uh, or as a, as a vertical. And I think the use cases that have been really interesting to us so far have been like relatively simple. It's, mm -hmm. you know, giving fans early access. So as a musician, you have so much music, which is not going to be, you know, packaged up in an album and put on Spotify. And it's like your remixes, your, you know, rough drafts, like kind of that whole archive of, of music you create, but don't or can't put out like that's music that your biggest fans would love to have access to. And they would certainly pay for that if you had the means to, to distribute it to them. Um, so I think that's a really interesting use case. I think with ticketing and events, you know, most of the uh, uh, consumer surplus, I guess you could say, is really siphoned away by ticket scalpers. Um, and as a musician, the ability to guarantee your biggest, you know, fans or your NFT collectors, you could guarantee them early access to every ticket that you ever, you know, sell in the future. And now there's no way that they're ever going to get scalped. And like, again, that's sort of a Pareto benefit where, as the collector, it's like, great, I'm getting like real value here. And as the musician, it costs you nothing to give out because it really is just mm -hmm. like routing money that used to go to scalpers to instead like your, your true fans. And so these aren't like earth shattering, like crazy ideas. It's like the stuff that they're already doing. It's making sure. music, it's selling tickets, it's selling merch. But we think that there's just so much efficiency to be gained by using the blockchain as kind of like that CRM and customer engagement platform, rather than relying on, you know, the, the platforms that they have um, available to them today. And then when you, as we're getting kind of towards the end, one more question around kind of like future outlook, if you're, you know, thinking like five years ahead and you were mentioning before that, you know, protocols at this stage, you know, you know, we don't have everything yet, all the kind of infrastructure maybe um, that you would want at this stage? Like, you know, what are some of the things you're looking forward to or, you know, hope for, you know, kind of the infrastructure to provide um, and, and some of them maybe, you know, five year ahead type of use cases then that you could implement? Yeah, so I think the, the two biggest ones that come to mind, I think the onboarding experience is, is still, uh, it's getting better and it's still abysmal. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, and we spend so much time in web three and like once you get onboarded it's actually a pretty great experience like no matter yeah. what site you go to you know you click connect wallet you sign this thing that's already yeah. like hanging out in your browser and you're just in no username no password no you know any of that yeah. any of that jazz when you're doing it for the first time it's still it's kind of crazy it's like yeah. all right well what is a seed phrase like oh i need to write this thing down if i lose it my money's gone forever also, like, where do I write it down? Because it says not to write it anywhere on my computer. So, like, I'm not supposed to write it on pen and paper, but, like, what? Like, what if I lose that? And then there's, like, custodial versus self-custodial. Like, it's very easy to, you know, hear about a project, get really excited about it, only to realize it's on a chain that you've never used before. And so the wallet that you already created is actually not going to work. And, like, you need to bridge assets. So it's, I think it's a nightmare. And, um <laughs> I think wallets and onboarding is like a, a piece of infrastructure that will get solved. And I think it will unlock all of the application builders growth. Um, so that's something yeah. we're really excited about. Um, and we do see, you know, we, we see a burden on ourselves to also be part of solving that problem. But um, I think that 
the wallet infrastructure is something that we very much don't want to own and which um, it's going to be largely responsible for that, that problem. The second one is um, I identity and having like um, really like chain agnostic identity solutions. I think uh, ultimately you're very, if you use Web3, you're very exposed to like what chain you're on, what side chain, what L2. Um, and I think over time, a lot of that gets abstracted away from the end user. And really it's, I have, you know, 50 MAT tokens and I know how I can use those tokens. I can sell those tokens if I want. I can send those tokens to somebody else. I don't need to care too much about exactly what chain I'm in right now. And like, yeah. do I need to like switch to this L2 and also the recipient, what chain are they on? Like, or what's their preference? So I think that a lot of that gets abstracted away. Um, yeah. And, and I think that's like another thing that will make building applications much more seamless because it's actually extremely tricky right now to solve for multiple different, you know, L2 ecosystems, multiple different chains. They have different standards. Like it, it's, it's chaotic. So I think that that's another thing that I'm really looking forward to. The layer three. <laughs> the layer three, exactly. The layer Absolutely. three. Absolutely. Um, Matt, finally, um, you know, I guess what I'd be really interested in is, you know, I mean, you seem, you know, to have really like the, the product management chops here. Um, you know, can you share some frameworks, some processes, some routines that you um, have adapted in your daily work life to um, kind of do what you do and do it in, you know, the best way possible? Yeah, um, I think for a, a big realization for myself was just um, like when I do certain types of work well. Um, and so like I found that really mornings are like the time of day where I can get analytical work or like kind of like really deep strategy work done. Like by mid afternoon, it's like, you know, hard for me to, to accomplish those tasks or at least do so like kind of at the same quality or, or speed or efficiency. So like I think one thing was just sort of understanding like my own personal work flow and like how to kind of like optimize that. And, and that's something that I found to really be a big unlock for me. I think when it comes to more of like the product management side of things, um, I think we're building a team that's global and remote first. And so I think that kind of creates new challenges when it comes to like product management or, or really product development at all. But I think, you know, really over communicating, um, leaning heavily on written communication, um, being like as, as detailed and specific as possible. Um, I found that that's been like really critical in terms of making efficient progress, um, especially in a world that's increasingly going to be asynchronous, you know, remote first. And um, I think there's a ton of benefits to that. You can hire the best talent anywhere in the world, but if you don't have a good operating system for how you like are building products in that distributed world, then, you know, that might end up actually like being that negative instead of being this really awesome, almost like superpower your team can have. Um, mm -hmm. So those are a couple of things that um, immediately jumped to mind. I don't know if that's the direction of, of yeah, what you're sure. asking. Yeah, and even like if you have any, you know, frameworks like you know, a little Eisenhower matrix once in a while when you don't know how to sure. prioritize. Uh... Sure, I think there. Um, so the two that I like one is just jobs to be done. I think that one's pretty timeless, and it, it forces you to just really zoom in and focus on the customer and like what actually are you solving for them, and and oftentimes like the actual thing is, uh, you know, somewhat uh, mm -hmm. intangible. And it's like the product itself, you know, even for Bonfire, it's like what I think we're really solving for creators and their communities is like connection. It's like a feeling of like control. It's the ability to make money. It's the ability to like have status or like recognition within the community you care about. It's like, you know, it's not airdrops and bounties and token gated content. It's really like something that's much deeper than that. Um, so I think jobs to be done is one. I think the second one is, um, it, this is like one that I got from Uber, but just sort of like, um, it's like the amount of investment that it's going to take, um, like how many people it'll impact and how great do we think is the magnitude of that impact. And so mm -hmm. that kind of gives you, um, you know, a, a, almost like an ROI estimate um, for like, you know, if this thing's going to take us just a couple of days to build, And it's going to create a lot of value for a lot of people. Well, then, like we should have done that yesterday. Um, whereas, mm -hmm. like if this is going to be a massive investment, but it's going to create a lot of value for all creators, you know, into the future, yep. then like that's probably worth the the amount of time it takes to get right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think like being really focused on that equation, 
at least helps you um, make tactical decisions in terms of like your priorities. Last question, Matt, is one I ask uh, pretty much everybody who comes on the pod, which is around sort of, you know, iteration, you know, that kind of, um, you know, incremental iteration to find, you know, or, you know, product market fit or, you know, to kind of grow your business once you have it versus, you know, the need to actually pivot and really go down a totally uh, di different direction, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever been faced with that kind of question um, or, you know, picked it up in, in your previous work, but I'm, I'm looking for, you know, here also kind of decision-making frameworks, you know, um, like how do people, you know, in startup entrepreneurship make that call, um, whether just to keep on iterating or, you know, kind of pivoting. And I'm yeah. sure like, especially in the bear market now, a lot of uh, founders will, will have to make that call. Totally. So, I mean, I definitely think that, um, so we, we definitely have experience here. So we pivoted, uh, Bonfire is like the second, like really big focused product that we've worked on, but in between product one and product two, we, you know, prototyped a lot of things, got to a lot of MVPs, um, explored kind of a few different areas before we really narrowed in on Bonfire. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is like, it's impossible to make that decision if you're not looking at metrics um and if you don't um like write down or articulate your thesis because it's very hard to know like are you losing or gaining conviction in a thesis that you haven't written down um and so i think that's one thing that um was really helpful for us was just knowing what we believed and then kind of on a regular cadence like checking in on like well has our conviction around what we believe increased or decreased based on what we've learned and um, you know, you obviously want to see that trajectory being pretty up and to the right over time. Um, and, and so I think that's one, um, I think right now, yes, bear markets, I think do expose, you know, flawed strategy, um, in a way that it may be, you had product market fit a month ago, but it was entirely dependent on, you know, speculative energy that no longer exists in the market. And so it's like, now maybe it's a go back to the drawing board sort of moment. Um, and I think. I mean, we've had all these like seismic shifts in the last few years, like the pandemic starting, then the pandemic ending, then this bear market. It's just like, you know, landscape shifts over and over again. And so I think no matter what level of product market fit or, uh, you know, conviction around your thesis you have today, like you have to be pretty consistent in checking yep. in on that and like rebasing um, because like the, the world that we live in is moving pretty rapidly these days. Um, so I guess those are like maybe a few thoughts on, on that in general, but I, I will say, you know, I've been a founder for two years and pivoted once. So maybe take that with a grain of salt as well. Yeah. Look at the ratios time to pivot. <laughs> yeah. It's a new exactly, metric. Yeah. New metric out there. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much uh, for sharing all of this and we wish you best of luck. Um, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see you at one of our conferences eventually. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to uh, attend. And thanks so much for having me. All the best, man. Thanks. Awesome. Cool, man. All right. Job's a good one. Thank you, Matt. Yes. Thanks so much. Yeah. I'm really excited. And, uh, you know, I'll let you know once we are, you know, ready. Um, I mean, you know, when you talk about tickets, that obviously could really also make sense for us uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we're, we're still like, now we have to raise some money and, you know, we have, we have some other urgent things, but we, we are uh, brainstorming already around it. So um, eventually maybe, you know, this could be a use case for you. Let's see. I don't know if, if, it, if you think it makes sense, but once I have a little bit more clarity, I can maybe send over an email if you like with a few bullet points on, on what we're thinking. Yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah, we're also moving more into the, we are moving towards the minting world a little bit more. Yeah. So enabling things like tickets and whatnot yeah. directly through Bonfire. So yeah, we'd love to chat when, uh, whenever you guys are, are ready. Exciting. Cool, man. Matt. Cool. Thank you so much. All the best, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Care, Have a great rest of your day. You too, man. Ciao, bye. Bye.